Hey there. Welcome to Kidney Conversations with Remand. It's a webinar designed by patients for patients and where we have open, honest discussions about kidney care. I'm Kiku Boyance, Executive Director for Remand, an organization dedicated to helping people with kidney disease make informed decisions about their kidney health. We're a group of everyday people who have experienced chronic kidney disease, dialysis, or have received a transplant. And we provide peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, guidance, and emotional support to encourage and empower those people who are on their kidney journey. Our website is a great place to learn more about what we do and the different ways you can help us help others on their kidney journey. Please visit remend.org. So what is a paired kidney exchange or kidney paired exchange? We have so much great information today, guys. I'm, uh, I'm gonna keep things moving right along so you can get the most information out of today's presentation. The one thing I would like to say is we chose this topic because we feel it's an important one and that people should be aware of their options because knowledge is power. But first, just a few housekeeping things. We want to hear from you, so please use the chat box and um, send us your questions. You know, um, let us know how you're doing today and where, you're, where you learned about today's webinar. Um, this will be the place that you can type questions and we'll answer them as they come in. If we miss any, we'll try to answer them at the end of the discussion. Uh, we also have a brief survey that you can complete anonymously. So the panelists today, we have Alexis Record. She's an altruistic kidney donor. Charles Wells Wellesley, an altruistic kidney donor as well. Cindy Polis, care manager and education nurse at Balboa United. Larry Putt, he's a new Riemann mentor and a recent transplant recipient. And Tammy Wright, transplant coordinator at Sharp Healthcare Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Center. Welcome everyone. Let's show everyone on screen here. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Hi guys. Thanks for being here. Let's see. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Well, a couple of you are returning. Well, you're all returning, except for Larry. Um, thank you. And Larry, um, you know, I'm just going to put you on the spot right away. I'm really excited about Larry because he reached out to Remend a couple of weeks ago, and we had a conversation, and I thought, oh, my gosh, Larry is perfect for this webinar. So I asked him, and he was kind enough to say yes. And so, Larry, would you mind sharing your story and, and what your experience is with um, Kidney Paired Exchange? Sure. No problem. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to discuss why I wanted to help Remend. And uh, the bottom line is with my kidney transplant, I really felt, thought, I thought a lot about this in the hospital and since I've had the transplant, that this is such an incredible gift that I really didn't realize it until I had it done, how much it meant to me and my family, my wife and myself and my family. Um, and I just felt like I needed to get back somehow, try to help people in this process because there was a lot of things I didn't know um, when the kidney disease was discovered. So my journey began about two and a half years ago on a general visit to my doctor. I, I had gotten a new general practitioner here in Colorado and she called me a couple of days after our, our, my physical and, and the blood work and she said, do you know that your kidneys aren't working right? And I said, no, nobody ever told me that. And she goes, do you feel okay? I said, yeah, I feel, I feel good, except I'm kind of tired in the afternoons and not that I'm 30 years old anymore, but I haven't felt that tired in a while. Long story short, um, she goes, I'm going to refer you to a nephrologist. You need to go see him because it's not good. I'm like, wow, oh, wow, that's, that's crazy. So she referred me to a nephrologist here in Colorado Springs. And, um, you know, the first thing out of his mouth is he goes, you're at stage three and it's getting worse. And I'm just stunned. I'm like, what? I, I just couldn't even believe it. You know, um, so what, what, what I did at that point, my wife and I both decided to research what this all meant because I had no idea. And so what the, one of the first things we did was, uh, we got a hold of a, a company that um, had a, a dietitian and she specialized in kidneys, 
kidney disease folks. So we enlisted this, her services and began the journey of at least for one thing, adjusting my diet so that I was eating the right things. And obviously with a renal diet, um, you know, there's only certain things you can eat. And I also went totally vegan, absolutely totally vegan. And um, so my background is, you know, back in the day, I was an athlete and, you know, I was telling my dietitian, I think I told you, Kiku, that um, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it about 150%. Um, there's no holding back. So my goal with the whole process was to stave off dialysis and keep my kidneys where they were, at least at that point. So what happened was I also wanted, I was on, I was on an exercise program already, but I, I really went to the gym and I really pushed myself harder to get myself in shape and um, hopefully get a transplant. When I went to the nephrologist originally, there was two options I was given and they were both dialysis. And so they referred me to a hospital in Denver called Porter Adventist Hospital. So we went up, met with those folks, and it was a whole different ballgame as far as learning my options and what we could do. So one thing they mentioned was, you know, you can you could do a, it wasn't paired kidney exchange, but my wife calls it get, give one to get one. And that's basically, she gave up one of her kidneys for me, or not for me, but gave up one of her kidneys to the so-called bank. And her kidney went to some someone on the West Coast. Um, and then when I took her up for a follow-up after her surgery, uh, it was a week after her surgery, um, the, our, our, uh, case person came in the room, our transplant coordinator and said, Larry, we have a recipient for you. And I just looked at her like, what? She goes, we have a recipient for, for you and September 28th is your date to get surgery. And I'm like, you, you got to be kidding because it was supposed to be 12 weeks at, at a minimum, you know? Um, so when she said that, I, I just was stunned, you know, I'm like, that is awesome. So um, that's basically uh, what happened on the 28th. I received a kidney from someone in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I'm not sure who it is, obviously. Um, but, you know, I had the surgery and, and um, I've been doing really well. I, I go uh, once a week for follow-up at Porter Adventist. And um, I have to say it, the surgical team and, and all the nurses and everybody there have been so fantastic. And that's one of their specialties at that hospital is dealing with kidney patients. And um, the amount of stuff that I've learned about kidneys is, is phenomenal. I, I just had no idea and it, it, was, it was just so different. The lifestyle changes, the, the diet. Um, my wife has just been so great as far as a partner for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, she gave up a kidney um, and she, she went through the surgery, the same testing I went through. And um, mm -hmm. then we came out where, shoot, I feel, it, I feel so much better pre-kidney disease that you know, um, I can't even describe it. I think I had kidney disease way before two and a half years ago, though, because I, yeah. I think back on how I felt and just the different things, like the different signs of kidney disease, you know, the itchy skin, the cramps, mm -hmm. um, things like that, that that's been happening with me for quite some time. Wow. And, um, you know, so, so the bottom line on the whole thing is that I, I've learned so much and that's what I want to be able to help somebody with is there is hope, you know, you, you got to work hard at it. I mean, I, it was, a, it was a long road. Um, not as long as some people, so I'm fortunate in that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but there, it, there are things that you can do to help yourself and, and um, try to stay healthy. And, and right. like I said, it's just been a phenomenal journey. I can't even, I can't even tell you how much I've learned and how much, how blessed I am to have this kidney. And this was, this was just in September, right? Yes. Yep. Look how great yeah. it looks. Just mm -hmm. September 28th. Seven weeks. I went seven, it was seven weeks this week ago that I had it. Right on. Yeah. So Larry, I had a question for you. Um, sure. Were it was your wife's blood type not compatible with yours? Is that the reason it, that you chose? It was compatible, but um, our surgeon 
met with both of us and, and he said that her kidney was too small. Mm, okay. That's so that's one of the reasons right. we do paired exchange. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so then her, you you talked about her doing advanced donation, right? Yes. So one of the benefits of advanced donation is she can donate and you can take care of her while she's recovering. Correct. And then later when you're recovering, she can take care of you. Correct. So that's one of the things for paired exchange, the benefits for some people. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Yep. I didn't even, I didn't even think about that. That's really cool. Um, so Tammy, while both you and Cindy are here, I just have a quick, um, thank you for sharing your story, Larry. Sure. Amazing. Thank you so much. How does um, your wife feel? Let me ask you that. <laughs> she's doing great. She's doing really good. And we, it, it, it's interesting because we had the same surgeon take hers out and the same, and the same guy put mine in. So um, we, we get, we've got a really good relationship with our, with our surgeon. He's a funny guy. And, you know, we, we joke around all the time and stuff and, uh, but she's doing fantastic. She really is. That's and you great. had your appointment today and your numbers were amazing. And yes, yeah, and they, they, get, they better get better and better every time I go. Right on. Congratulations, Larry. That's a beautiful Thank you. story. I that really it. is. Thank you. So guys, just really quick. I have this little thing I'm trying to do here with true or false. And I'm going to see if these are true or false statements. And if you'd like to answer, please do. True or false, the kidney is the most commonly transplanted organ from a living donor. Is that true, Tammy? That is true. Um, I just looked up some of the statistics and uh, the transplants in the United States between January and October 2022, there's been 5,346 living kidney transplants. Wow. wow. Which is awesome. That is awesome. Thank you for looking that up. Um, is it true or false that better genetic matches between you and your donor decrease the re risk of organ rejection? Tammy, for $200. For $200. <laughs> I think, no, I think that might be a $1,000 question. <laughs> Uh, yes, the better genetic match mm -hmm. does decrease your risk of organ rejection. However, you don't have to match any genetic markers in order to be able to be compatible with your recipient, your, the donor and recipient. Um, I call it icing on the cake when you have, uh, when you are more compatible, um, but it does not, most majority of our transplants that we do are not people that are even related. And so mm -hmm. um, believe it or not, sometimes through the donor exchange program, you can find somebody that has a great match for you. And uh, you can find somebody out there that you never even knew existed that has similar genetic markers. Your genetic markers come from where your point of origin is. So similar points of origin are going to have similar genetic markers. And that's why you may have somebody uh, from back east who, donate, who donates and matches you. Um, it, like Larry said, I think you said that you had somebody from the Atlanta area. Yep. And uh, so it, uh, we are all somewhat inter, intermixed <laughs> to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hey, somebody just wrote, I um, answered him, let's see, Subash Bach, I can't pronounce your name, Subash, um, said he had a kidney transplant as a, a pair of kidney exchange as well. So I asked if they would share their experience in the chat here. Um, and my last one, the last true or false, Tammy, kidneys from living donors usually work immediately as the kidney is removed from a healthy donor and transplanted right away. So if it's not a living donor, does it sometimes stall out? Like, does it, does it take a, a little bit sometimes to get started? We call them sleepy kidneys. Oh, um, okay. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the body to get used to that kidney. Um, and with living transplants, typically we see urine when they are on the table getting their kidney put in. And it's always a wonderful thing when we, I always say to the surgeon when he comes out, <laughs> 
did they pee on the table? Um, <laughs> because peeing on the table is a great thing for me. <laughs> that sounds like it's a bad thing. It's not in my world. Because uh, that means the kidney perked up and it made urine and it did what it was supposed to do. Right. Right on. Since um, we have Tammy chatting it up here, we've got your slides. Would you like to just give us a broad overview of what kidney paired exchange is? And the first slide I have here is who enters a KPE program? What is what does that mean? Well, Larry is a perfect um, example. And thanks for sharing that with us is that uh, they didn't think your wife was large enough or that her right. kidney would be a good kidney match ma right. mass for you. So a lot of times people don't realize that we, we're born with the same kidneys forever for our life. So we only have certain amount of nephrons, which are those functioning parts of our kidney that work. And as we get older, those nephrons get a little bit more worn out, a little bit more tired, and our kidney function isn't quite as well. So we have to make sure that we're going to be able to put a kidney in a recipient who has enough nephron mass for that recipient to have benefit from that transplant. <clears throat> Majority of the time, a lot of times there may be blood type incompatible. And so through the donor exchange program, they can be a great healthy donor, but they, can, but they aren't the same blood type as their recipient. Uh, and so in order to do that, they can, as Larry did, get a kidney from somebody who's, um, who's compatible with them. Um, sometimes we have some recipients that are really difficult to match and the people that have that are harder to match, we maybe can maybe we'll find a match for them through the donor exchange program because our pool is better. It's bigger, it's larger. We have a larger group of donors to find potentially that magic match for somebody. Um, and sometimes we can find a better match. Uh, maybe they come in and the match is nothing and we can find a match for them that's really, really good. Uh, better age match. Sometimes we have recipients that um, come in and they're in their early 20s and their their parents want to donate who are in their 60s or 70s. And, you know, that's a great thing. The kidney will still work, but the kidney from a 60 or 70 year old putting in a 20 year old is not going to last as long. So maybe we can find a more a better age match through the exchange. And there is perfectly somebody out there that love to have that 60, 70 year old kidney um, who needs that. And we can find a recipient who matches better that age. So um, it's definitely a, a good way for some people to go through the, the getting a transplant. There's not always one way to get it. There's multiple ways to get it. Um, and uh, one of the ones that I have the most privilege for working with is what we call non-directed donors or altruistic donors. Um, so you're gonna hear from Alexis and, and Charles yeah. um, later. And they were people who just decided, hey, I have a kidney and it works. <laughs> I'm gonna help somebody. Um, I may not know the person I'm gonna help, but you know what? My belief is, is that we should all help each other if we can. And they both believed that they could. Um, I thought that they were both a little bit crazy when they told me that both of them wanted to donate. Uh, you know, um, they were just new, their parents, they had Don't small give children. it up yet. Tim. Oh, okay. Don't, Don't give, give it up. up. Don't give it up. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so <laughs> the pretty obvious um, exchange is uh, the donor is a mother who wants to donate to her son and they're not compatible blood type wise. Some people say to me, well, she can't be his mother if they're not blood type compatible. That's not the case. Um, mothers can have different blood types than their children, even though they're biological children. So sometimes people start rumors and they're like, oh, she can't donate. Um, so that's the simplest one. Uh, a pretty simple swap. We can match kidneys and, and swap donors for that. Yeah, we had a video last time where 
two women worked together, they were co-workers for some time, and they just happened to be talking about their situation. Like one, one woman's husband needed a kidney and they were the, her friend's, her co-worker was a perfect match for her husband. So that was, that's kind of like this. And yeah, it's a swap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a swap. Yep. Kidney swap. Uh, kidney swap. <laughs> here's the uh and it can get even more more intricate in that uh with a non-directed donor starting a chain they can donate to a recipient whose donor is not compatible and the largest chain that i've been involved with i believe it was 35 wow uh, it was in the new york time um, this was back in the day. We really honestly don't have as huge of chains in any more swaps. Um, the more the more you have, the more com, um, you know uh, it, it can get it can get harder and harder and harder and the more um, the longer time that it takes. So mm -hmm. a lot of times now we're doing shorter chains with less risk of it not something falling apart. So oh. um, Tammy, how long have have chains been going on? Like, how long has kidney paired exchange been been going on? So, a lot of centers back east started doing the kidney paired exchange. They had a little bit of group within the certain transplant centers that they all um, started it. And that I know that the National Kidney Registry started in two thousand seven. Um, I believe, and don't quote me on years, but I believe John Hopkins and some of the other larger centers were doing it prior to that. Mm. Um, and for some reason, um, we weren't doing it through the United Network for Organ Sharing until a little bit later. And luckily, a lot of people came on board and realized, hey, this is, this is a no-brainer. Right, right. Wow. That's huge. I, my situation, I was, I'm also a patient and, you know, 25 years ago, my brother wanted to donate to me, but that wasn't an option. So it's, I'm so happy to hear that, you know, a lot of, a lot of times family like Larry's wife and my brother want to donate. And so here's an option. If, if you aren't a match or, you know, there's an issue with someone having a smaller kidney, then it's right. good for you. So awesome. Um, and speaking of, you know, oh, types of living donor transplants. I wanted you to go over this slide too, Tammy, if you would. Okay. Um, just explain the different types of donors. Um, so uh, you can have a directed donation donor. I believe that there's somebody on the line, Dennis had his brother donate to him. Um, so they were blood type compatible and Dennis I hope you don't mind me count, count counting you out and oh, calling yeah, you Dennis. out <laughs> <laughs> um, so his brother <laughs> was able to donate directly to him mm -hmm. um, we have the Alexis and Charles of the worlds who are an altruistic donor a non-directed donor um, the good thing that's happening now that wasn't happening back when they donated is sometimes now you can do something called a voucher donation. So mm -hmm. when they donated, we didn't have this system in place. Now the system that we have in place is if they came in to donate now, they could name five family members that if anything ever happened to them in their lifetime that they needed a transplant, one of them would be benefited by their donation. And wow. so that started recently um, and it's called family voucher. And basically it's when you know that somebody isn't, you don't know of anybody that really has kidney problems, but what it, what it does is it opens it up so that those people that are healthy, that worry, what if my child should need a transplant at some point, have right. that, um, ability to be able to get their, their child transplanted if they need to. And then, uh, the paired exchange, um, is basically somebody a donor is compatible with a recipient and they swap kidneys they can be two three four five ten deep it just really depends right i wanted to address two questions or comments here in the in the chat um here's one from win who's also a new remen mentor hi win um he said i never knew my 
my uh, living donor until seven days before transplant. So don't be afraid to ask anyone. Don't be afraid to share your story with people because you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Um, Subash got back to us and said he's from Tampa, Florida and received his transplant in 2015 at the University of Alabama. And it's very good program. I hope all hospitals have one group. Um, have one group will be better. So thanks Alabama is known for uh, doing donor exchanges internally um, oh. within their own system. Oh, wow. Why is it only, well, that's a whole they, other. They have a large program that's able okay. to do that. And okay. so uh, a lot of centers don't have the large enough program to be able to have donors that match other donors. And so that's why we use the uh, other programs that we'll talk about okay. at the very end. All right. And since we were talking about altruistic donors, oh, the first <laughs> <laughs> non-directed donor couple from 2012 and 2013, ladies and gentlemen, Alexis and Charles. <laughs> I'm hey. sorry, I had to pull it out. <laughs> I'll stop the share. Guys. So guys, I mean, I've heard your story a few months ago, maybe it was last year, but please, I loved your story. So please share like who, you know, what was your motivation? Who started first? What, what's, what's your story? Sure. So, uh, we donated, well, I donated 10 years ago now. Um, I had read a profile of someone years before that had said in passing that this person had donated a kidney to a stranger on the grounds that the odds that it would damage his own health were very, very low, and the odds that he could help extend someone else's life were very, very high. Uh, and that stuck with me for a long time because I wanted to be the kind of person for whom that logic would be persuasive. And it stuck with me long enough that eventually I said to my wife, like, I want to I want to investigate what it would be like to donate a kidney. What is it dangerous? Uh, do people need kidneys? What's the story? And and uh, I said, no, absolutely not. She said, okay, eventually. <laughs> and, and we came in to meet with Tammy here at Sharp Hospital. And Tammy explained that essentially, yeah, our, our vague impression was right. The odds of us suffering any health consequences were very, very low. And the odds that we could extend someone else's life by like 10 or 15 years were very, very high. So uh, she also informed us about donor chain and this idea that you that your donation could allow multiple transplants to take place, which all sounded fantastic. And so ultimately, I we we talked about it, and uh, I don't know if you want to jump in at any point here. <laughs> well, I had told him no. Uh, he absolutely could not do that, and then. I finally agreed to meet with this lady named Tammy who I'd never met. <laughs> and I showed up to that meeting like an inquisitor. I had my little notebook and pen and stern look, very intimidating and asked all my questions. And then by the end of that meeting, not even by the end, midway through that meeting, we were both on board to be donors because wow. we just needed the, we needed the information. Yeah. Tammy's the kidney whisperer. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> well, when I said, hey, could I do this too? She did laugh. <laughs> well, come on, tell them the story. Tell them who you came in with. Okay. So we do have, at the time we had one and we were in the process of, um, we were in the middle of adopting another child with severe lifelong disabilities. And we were already doing multiple surgeries and in the last 10 years, we've done 10 more surgeries at least, uh, yeah. 10, 15, you lose count. So we were in the hospital a lot and I don't, I don't know how we did it 10 years ago. Now they're teenagers and all the surgeries have resulted in, they're both ambulating. Um, they use power chairs out of the house, but they're both able to change their own clothes and 
uh, feed themselves and all of those fun independent things. So life is a little easier right now. But at the time, Tammy did see the wheelchair and the uh, the need for one of us or both of us to be someone else's arms and legs. And, and she's like, I think you have a lot going on. So uh, what we did is we did Charles's surgery. And then a year and a half later, once everything was a little more settled, so we weren't recovering at the same time. So we had lots of, and we had lots of help and a great community. Um, then I was able to donate. Oh my gosh, guys. I, I, I've heard it before, but I still can't get over it. Um, what was the recovery like? And I wanted to know that about your wife too, Larry, but what was the recovery like for you guys? Yeah. So for me, I was, you know, uh, sleeping and, and getting back into a normal routine, like about a week, week and a half in, uh, was back to work at, well, it was, was having sex again in two weeks, uh, back to work at three and a half weeks. People want to know this sometimes. Uh, this took me a little by surprise is all. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, at about eight weeks, able to, uh, you know, run or, or exercise strenuously without ever having been reminded that I had donated eight weeks ago. How about you? Um, I saw him go through like the worst time and, and it was a man cold because mine was so easy. Um, it was about two weeks and I was back to normal. And, um, and I know that's a rare, <laughs> that's more rare. I've had flus worse than that recovery. And my previous surgery experience was a C-section, which is major abdominal surgery. And this was a little laparoscopic. I didn't even get a cool scar. Because if you've had another major surgery, they just go through the same scar. So I didn't get a new one. Um, <laughs> and it was so, I, in fact, I came to my two-week checkup and I think it was Dr. Vapnik um, huh? yelled at me. He saw me and he's like, put that baby down. I'm holding <laughs> Roland at the time. <laughs> he was two and a half, but he weighed very, like, oh I remember gosh. looking up, how much can I lift? I got in trouble. Um for going back to work or going back to normal too soon, but I really was feeling really great. And mm -hmm. there's this little high you get because you're like, yeah, you know, this surgery isn't because you're sick. It's not because you're feeling bad. It, it it's just it's all bonus. It's all feel goods. And wow. you know, my surgery kicked off 14 surgeries in three days and saved seven lives. And you know, so there's this high of it's not a normal surgery recovery where something was wrong and it got repaired. This was only positive. So I think that helped my recovery too. Oh my gosh. And Charles, how about you? How was your kidney? How did that go with your chain or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had a chain of two uh, exchanges. Mm -hmm. So I donated to someone and then someone donated on their behalf to someone else. Right on. We need more of this. Thank you guys so much for that. I can't, it's insane. And Larry, how about your wife? How, what was her recovery like? Her recovery was really fast. Um, and I'm convinced with her, it's her attitude about, um, well, she has an extremely high pain threshold and uh, she's been bucked off. She has two horses. She's been bucked off her horse several times and um, some pretty serious injuries throughout her life. But uh, her attitude on recovering and doing what she needs to do to get better. Um, she's really strong at it. And it was interesting. The first follow-up, we went back to talk to the surgeon, you know, um, <laughs> I told the surgeon, I said, now you, you're going to have to clarify what she can do and what she can't do. Because if we don't, she's going to go above and beyond what she should do. And that's her nature. So I said, she has two horses. He goes, oh, do you plan on riding the horses right away? And she goes, well, not right away. She goes, but I have a question for you. And he goes, what's that? She goes, can I put the saddle on the horse? And he goes, how much does the saddle weigh? She goes, 35 pounds. He goes, uh, no, no, I can't do that. I said, see, you don't know who you're talking to. That's what I'm talking about. You got to clarify it. You got to make sure it's clear what she can do but overall she's been she's been fantastic and the recovery was 
shoot, I don't know, time-wise, I would say um, two to three weeks, she was pretty much back to normal. The only issue she had was um, gas pains from the anesthesia. That was, mm. was uh, her biggest obstacle. But other than that, you know, she never hit the pain button in the hospital or, you know, mm. uh, she doesn't like to take medication. So any, anyway, I, I just think that her attitude on recovery is what got her through. Right. Right. Wow. Well, um, is there a, is there a legal age, Tammy? Cindy, do you guys know if there's a legal age to be able to donate? 18 is what, uh, they have to, they have to be legal age of 18. Mm -hmm. Um, now I know that through bone marrow, they may be able to do some that are younger. I don't know those Mm -hmm. rules, but for us, they have to be 18. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, we've also made it so that if somebody comes in like Alexis or Charles, we want them to be 25 to make that decision. And, um, there's been some studies that just basically, if somebody's making decisions before that age, they probably need to think a little bit more about what they're doing. Um, Mm. so, okay. Because what you don't want is some young, young kid coming in, donating a kidney and thinking they can have sex two weeks later. <laughs> That's right. That is so true. I would have never, never even thought about that. I would have huh? never even thought about that. <laughs> well, okay. So let me ask you this. Say you have a donor, you know, you're ready to go. What's the next step? What do, what do you do? Uh, usually the transplant center, if like Larry was working with Porter. And so whoever that transplant center is that you're working with, they need to reach out and ask um, for the donor team. Um, We have an intake form that needs to be done first. And the things are basic on there that we end up screening for, but we want to make sure that a person's not um, a true diabetic Um, because people with diabetes do have a higher risk of having kidney problems in the future. It's the number one cause of kidney failure, especially in San Diego. Um, High blood pressure, as long as they're uh, not not in their 20s or 30s, um, and they're on one blood pressure medicine, then we can consider them as long as their blood pressure is under good control. Um, We want to make sure that they're not too overweight. Um, People that are overweight can Uh, it can cause problems with their kidneys later if they live with one kidney. And so we have, you know, guidelines that we look at. Um, We want to make sure we do no harm. Of course, that's pretty obvious. Uh, We don't want to trade one person donating a kidney for them to later need a transplant themselves. So those are the things that we really have to really honestly watch out for. Um, We do as Alexis will tell you and Charles, we do a lot of testing. Um, Mm -hmm. They have to pee in a jug for 24 hours. Uh, That's going to tell us their kidney function. If their kidney function is too low, we're going to tell them, no, you can't donate. They have to have a lot of blood drawn. Um, If you're a person who (laughs) doesn't do well with blood draws, um, that, you know, can be a little intimidating. Uh, But for some people that wasn't that intimidating, even though uh, blood draws wasn't their favorite thing in the world to do. Um, you have to have the best physical ever. They're gonna do CT scans to look at your kidneys. We're gonna do an exercise stress test if you're a certain age to make sure that your heart's okay. Uh, you're gonna see a social worker, a dietitian. Um, you're gonna see a donor advocate. You're gonna see a bunch of people and they're gonna ask you a bunch of personal questions. I wanted to, you mentioned donor advocate. Um, We know there are advocates for patients, but Alexis and Charles, did you, so you had a a donor advocate. What was that like? What was that experience like? I remember getting asked a lot if, you know, we understood everything, just just a lot of double checking. Um, So you sit through a meeting, especially after I passed out, giving the little blood samples, which is what you were insinuating. (laughs) That's, (laughs) That was me. I was the one that passed out. And because the altruistic donor, all the medical stuff is free. I got a free ride in an ambulance to the ER so they could tell me nothing's wrong with you. You just saw blood and you passed out um, and you have to lie down next time. And then I showed up the next week. I'm like, hey, I'm the kidney donor that I can't look at it and I need to lie down. 
and one of the uh what are they called phlebotomists one of, they lost money they had to pay money to that oh, we swore you wouldn't be back <laughs> Every but time it was all uh, just people checking in like, oh, hey, you can stop at any time. And even to the point where they were like, we won't tell your husband. We won't tell your kids. We will come up with a reason you can't be a donor. So I felt that I had at any time for any reason with no repercussions and with the full support, even though people's lives are on the line, you feel that weight, even with the full support of all the medical staff and all the, the coordination team and um, that I could have backed out and just said, I don't feel like it anymore with no real reason. And they would have come up with a reason to give officially. And I could have sat there and gone, oh, I can't darn it. And so I really felt like they had my back. And that is, right. is you have to go in this fully informed with full consent. And if you didn't have that advocate on your side, really making sure you were really, really okay with this. Um, I mean, you thought out all the repercussions and then this included like a trip to the psychologist's office to make sure you were really, um, and then we both had the fun experience of having to school that person on what kidney donation involved. The therapist? <laughs> yeah, the therapist didn't know. We have, oh, a better, we have a better therapist now. He's yeah. actually <laughs> part of the trans team. Awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. Oh, you We've had, had him the on same before. misconceptions I had before I <laughs> talked to Tammy. You need to talk to Tammy, and will be there. <laughs> we have a different. We have a different therapist now. Uh, different psychologist. Uh, yes, he's very knowledgeable. Everyone, he's I've, extremely knowledgeable on, on the broadcast before. Yes. Again, this was a decade ago. So yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. So wow. So I was going to ask you. I thought maybe a donor advocate was. A psychologist is that no it's completely separate our donor advocate is actually an rn um, oh. but the donor advocate that i think alexis and charles saw was a chaplain um and we've had different different entities as long as they are there to make sure that that the person who is coming through to donate has thought about all of the things that they need to think about um and has thought this process through uh, and that they are educated and, and it, you know, have made a decision based on facts, not necessarily just based on, oh, it would be a great thing to help seven people as it did with Alexis and two people with as it did with Charles. Um, I mean, it really, honestly, you have to think about there are risks. It's, it's surgery. It's serious. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to see what your suggestions were maybe Cindy, Larry, I, you know, a lot of people feel uncomfortable about having that conversation with somebody um, asking them to be a donor for them. What, I mean, even if it's a family member, they feel uncomfortable and awkward asking, do you, Larry, did you have, what kind of conversation did you have with your wife about that? Or did she just come to you and say, I'm doing it? Like, what, what was that like? She's the one that came to me. Uh, we, we had discussed, we have two daughters older daughters and they obviously both volunteered to do it but we we wanted to do something different because they're young um and uh, we just didn't feel right about them giving up one of their kidneys at this point in their life so that's when trish stepped up and right away immediately said okay then once we learned about you know like tammy said um to be able to donate it, her kidney that's when we went full speed ahead at that point. So that's how that all came about. But she was the one that brought that forward. Really quick, Wynn says, my donor was a horse lady as well. Oh. <laughs> horse lady. Horse lady. <laughs> yeah, right on, Wynn. <laughs> it takes all kinds. <laughs> what do you suggest, Cindy? Do you have conversations about this with patients? Because I know you're talking to patients daily. And what have you had these types of yeah, What's it's like? not easy. It's hard because, you know, they, we, we typically talk about dialysis because they don't have a transplant donor available. And, you know, majority of the population that I work with are, are older and they just figure that they just can't ask their family because they feel like, you know, they're older. 
Um, but sometimes, you know, even if they're in their 60s or, you know, 50s, you know, I mean, even 70s to me and this CKD population, that's kind of young still, even in your 70s. So um, what I like to do is talk about uh, a champion. Maybe we learned about this, you know, at Sharp and how, what does that mean and what is a champion and and uh how can I work with a champion and maybe it's a family member that can champion for you mm. they understand more of how to use the tools that are available mm -hmm. to work as a champion for you maybe social media maybe you belong to a church so um or groups there's a lot of good social media groups that are all interconnected um, so I try to give them at, at least options out there if they're hesitant about asking a family member mm -hmm. um, to champion for themselves. Um, but it's a very, very hard discussion. And a lot of them, you know, and, it, and, and it's because of their culture and they believe that that's not right to ask of their family members. Um, so, yeah, it's not an, it's a very sensitive, sensitive topic, right. but timing sometimes it's the right time to talk about it uh, at least give them options out there what, I think what what's are, important is um to tell their story they don't have to ask about for donation they just need to mm -hmm. say hey you know I have this kidney disease going on and this is what's going on and the doctors tell me that I'm going to need dialysis or a transplant that's all you need to say and then there's people out there that that think like Charles and like Alexis, you know, they they read an article that says something that kind of makes them think that maybe this is something they could do. Um, and so you just never honestly know who could proceed with donation for you until you tell them what's going on. We've had some really creative um ways of people sharing their stories too. And just recently, um, someone who had been working with Remand, Anamika. Um, she, yeah, she, um, I had the, her signs actually for when we were at the transplant games. Um, she, her husband put a, a magnet on the side of his truck, his work truck said his wife needed a kidney with the phone number. It's actually your phone number, Tommy. It was my phone number, everybody, <laughs> on the back of a- Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was quite interesting. I got this picture in my email and I went, wait a minute, that's my phone number. <laughs> uh, it was going all over you, San Diego. Yeah, but, she, but it worked. It worked, it worked. And then others, you know, mentioned putting a lawn, a, a sign on their lawn. Some people have business cards made up, of course, you know, having a website, things like that. It's just really sharing your story and telling, you know, you never know who's going to hear it or who's going to be like Alexis and Charles, you know? So um, one thing I would, would like to talk about, um, Tammy, is your other slide here about um, the programs. Let me get that up here. There's three major programs um, that I know of. And if there's more out there that I don't know of, uh, there are some through individual uh, transplant centers. So I believe that um, Subash was talking about, I think you were in Alabama. Um, so the organ donation or OPTN, UNOS has a kidney paired donor exchange program um, that works with a lot of transplant centers. The Alliance for Paired Donation has a program also, and then the National Kidney Registry, which is the registry that we use they've done almost 6,300 living transplants since 2008. And uh, Alexis and Charles donated through the donor exchange program um, through the National Kidney Registry. They have close to 100 hospitals that they are affiliated with and we all work together. I'm in a swap right now. Um, and uh, I'm in two swaps right now. Uh, one of them is a four-way swap and uh, we'll be getting a kidney from Virginia Mason in Seattle, and we will be sending a kidney out to, I can't even remember where we're sending it to now, but it will be on the right plane, I promise. 
Georgetown. Okay. Um, and then Crazy. we have another swap that we're doing. And that one, we're getting a kidney from Cornell and we're sending a kidney to UCLA. So wow. all of these transplant centers are working together hand in hand to make all of our patients get the transplants that they need. Um, and we all work together, you know, uh, it's, it's a great thing. I've, I've gotten lots of friends through that and I've gotten lots of, of knowledge that I wouldn't have had, had I not had that experience. So the kidney swap is available anywhere in the U S and the patient doesn't really have to, I mean, if they have a donor, are they elevated on the list on the transplant list? If they have somebody that doesn't match them? Uh, they, it, it's a pool of living donors in the exchange program. It doesn't do anything for the deceased donor pool. Um, mm -hmm. It's in the living donor program. Mm -hmm. um, so each recipient, each place, when you go out to your transplant center, ask them if they do paired exchange. Everybody has different alliances with different paired exchange groups. Uh, and our, we just happen to have one with the National Kidney Registry. So Subash had mentioned, let's see, he said that, I mean to say if all U.S. hospitals has one group as a pair kidney exchange, it's very easy. I was registered with 10 hospitals with my donor for a paired kidney exchange. What does that mean? Um, I think that Subash is saying that they were at more than one transplant center. And so some people can do a list uh, um, transplant centers have different wait times. And then also let's say that he's at a center that, uh, works with the national kidney registry and another center may work with the OPTN or UNOS. Another center may work with the allied Alliance for paired donation that just opens them up completely to different, different groups. Um, okay. Uh, Wynn also mentions, uh, I went to a local clergy person and discussed my situation. I asked him to share my needs with the whole religious denomination in San Diego area. Be broad with your asks. Thank you for the, the tip, Wynn. Thank you for that. I have a question um, for Tammy. What if I have a patient, like let's say, wants to receive a kidney from their brother and they live in Germany? Uh, we do, um, we've had people come from Israel. We've had people come from the Philippines, Vietnam. The hard part about it is they have to get a visa to come over here. And so oftentimes we'll write a letter. Um, I'm working with somebody right now who's wants to come from Jamaica to donate. And, um, with COVID it's honestly been a little difficult. Yeah. Uh, we've, I've written, written multiple, multiple letters, um, but we often will write a letter stating that the recipient will take all the charges and all the costs of their medical care mm -hmm. here in, in the United States and taking care of their housing and all of that, and please allow them to come. Um, I have somebody did a donor exchange. They were uh, from, I believe they were from the Philippines, and she stayed for six months while we found a match for her sister because they weren't a match. Mm -hmm. um, she donated her kidney and went back to the Philippines. Interesting. Wow. Thank you. That's Do good to know. Yeah. Is it becoming, I mean, how many of these have you done this, this year, Tammy? There's yeah. not as many. Um, it, it, we've probably done a handful. We've done maybe five. Uh, we're on track to do 37 living transplants this year, which mm -hmm. is a lot better considering a COVID situation. It's mm -hmm. actually COVID's been a little difficult for a lot of uh, these surgeries because first off, uh, you know, it's a disease. COVID can cause problems with people that are immunosuppressed and uh, we don't always have the vaccines aren't always effective. Um, and so we've had some, you know, decrease in our, in our ability to be able to do those transplants. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it looks like we're turning a corner and it looks like um, we're going to be able to be able to help more and more people. The problem is, is that there's 90,000 people waiting for kidney transplants on the, in the United States. And of those 90,000, um, 
there've only been 30,000 deceased donors. So there's never going to be enough deceased donors to be able to um, take care of all those people that need transplants. The only way that we can do that is increasing living donation. And that's why we do what we do. We're trying to educate people about this. Um, and not uh, it. Yeah. Thank you for the facts. <laughs> Um, you know, we're coming up to the time, guys. I can't believe it went by so quickly. So what I like to do um, in closing before we end today's webinar, I'd like to ask our panelists, what do you hope our viewers will learn from our conversation today? Uh, Larry. I, I hope that you learn that, that there, there is hope. And like Kiku and, and several others said, it's all about education. It's all about learning what your options are, um, how to keep yourself healthy. Again, in my case, I had no idea uh, anything about kidney disease, didn't know I had it. And it was a crash course in, you know, trying to keep myself where I was with the kidney disease and, you know, do what I can do to, to stay alive, basically. So there, there's hope, there's people that will help and I'm going to be one of those people, hopefully, that can help somebody through the process. And again, it's education. It's just learning. You know, right. don't be don't be hopeless. There is hope. There's there's right. avenues we can go down. And I wanted to give a shout out to Amy, who referred you to Reman. She was on our um, plant based diet uh, episode, and um, you went vegan. And so, shout out to the Kidney Nutrition Institute. Um, Fascinating. <laughs> I want to hear more about that. We'll talk later, Larry. Um, Alexis and Charles. Thank you, Larry. Alexis and Charles, what would you like people to, to learn from today's topic? Uh, I would just say I want them to take away that donation is a, is a doable thing. It's a thing that people can do and, and they can do it. And the hospital will make sure that you're healthy enough to do it. And like there are other times I spent three and a half weeks playing video games that were more pleasant than this particular three and a half <laughs> weeks, but like it's, it's a hundred percent, uh, achievable. Yeah, wow. that's, that's it right there is, um, it was a couple weeks of recovery. It wasn't too bad. Uh, I got other people to pair my kids and they're, um, they're a lot. So that was nice actually. <laughs> And the best, the best was I was still in the hospital and I talked to Tammy and she said, and I, you know, just my kidney got the last time I heard going out, my kidney was on an, an overnight flight, a red eye to New York. And she just said, it's pink and making urine. And my brain was like, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> um, I like just, urine. <laughs> Not always the case, <laughs> getting pink fast, producing fast, lasting longer. That is not something a cadaver kidney is going to provide for people. Mm -hmm. So it's not only very necessary to, to save the tens of thousands of lives a year that we're losing. It is also um, it just, it does a lot of good and the recovery wasn't so bad. And I would do it again if I had a third one in there somewhere. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cindy, what say you? Oh, wow. I'm just so taken by the generosity and the big yeah. heart in this audience. You know, wow. That's that's so tremendous and that's so big and it's so beautiful to see all of you out there and to be so giving and generous of you. I mean, that's a special kind of caliber of individual so I just want to say thank you for taking, for doing such a, giving such a gift. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think I, I, I was a little surprised by like the kidney size. I just automatically assumed like my kidney would be compatible with anybody, you know, the size, but, mm -hmm. you know, golly, if my husband needs a kidney, I don't think it's going to fit. <laughs> 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 um so I I didn't realize that so um that was interesting to learn that today so mm -hmm. size matters <laughs> yeah so I I just assumed you know mine would fit anybody so nope yeah wow 
Um, so thank you. Thanks for hosting this, Kiku. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually have two, I received two kidneys. So I've got four, two that aren't working and two that work up front. So yay for me. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, Miss Tammy, what are um, your thoughts? Well, I feel it's an honor to work with uh, the altruistic donors who step forward, the donors that step forward to help those that they love. Um, you know, I've been doing this here for 19 years and I did 10 years of organ donation before that. I feel honored every day of my life. Um, it was funny yesterday, um, I ran into a patient <clears throat> And he said, do you remember me? My name is Leo. And I said, okay. <laughs> and he said, a year ago, you called me at 2.51 in the morning and told me that you had a transplant for me. He said, I have it on my phone right here. Listen, oh. Oh my he God. said, I've kept your message for all that time. And I, you know, it's an honor to be able to help others have a better quality of life and to be able to help others donate a kidney if that's what they decide that they want to do. You know, um, I'm honored every day of my life and I enjoy what I do and I, and I like being able to help. Guys, I am just, I'm just so emotional about today. There's, you know, I'm usually pretty talkative, but um, thank you for all that you do, all of you. I mean, I'm just, I don't want to start crying. <laughs> so I would like to thank all of our panelists today uh, for an awesome discussion and uh, for agreeing to participate and help educate people about kidney paired exchange. Thank you so much, guys. Um, now I'm going to... Thank you all for your stories out there too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys for watching. Um, you know... And guess what? Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, but if you or someone you know is dealing with kidney disease and would like to speak to someone, please reach out to Remand. Um, our website address is remand.org. Uh, reach out on our contact page and see how you can be involved. You can also check our previous webinars on remand.org or our YouTube channel. Um, all of us at Remand and our wonderful partner and partners and friends here want you to know that you're not alone. A lot of people think that, you know, nobody's here or nobody wants to help me with my situation. Nobody understands, but that's not true. You have resources and people who want to listen and who care. So thank you all for watching. Thank you for being here and peace out. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>